We're up. Yeah. Good morning, church. Good morning. And thank you so much for joining us today. Today is Communion Sunday. Did you get your little uh, little packet? We will do that um, after our opening prayer. But uh, we also, oh, did that shut off on you? Okay, and you need your, um, your pointer is there too. So you need to wake up, there we go. Oh, we need to go down to open the song. <clears throat> For those online, we have a new format here. We're not using the canned music anymore. We're, uh, <laughs> Lord have mercy. Bless these arthritic fingers. I'm playing the piano. Okay, then you go to present. Yeah, I did, but it, oh, that, that one. They can't use the music over it anymore? Well, they've, um, there's been an issue with it. I haven't gotten uh, penalized for it or anything, but uh, it's happened several times. They've uh, deleted uh, some of the live streams. So, um, did you bring that down? Did you turn it on? Yeah. And then bring yeah. it down? Okay. Turned it up. up. Mm -hmm. There we go. We're going to start off with Praise God. I'm nervous. This is the second time I've played. I can't read music. I can read letters. And that's how I transpose everything to letters. Okay, are you ready? come to you with expectation in our hearts. We know that without you, Lord, we can do nothing. Your word is a light for our path and a lamp for our feet. Help us to always be obedient to your decrees and to listen to your word and follow your directions. Be with us today in a mighty way. We need you, Lord, and we always want to need you. And help us to never be filled with pride that causes us to fall away from your way, God. Let us hear your voice and help us to follow your directions. We know that we can do all things through you because it is through you that we gain knowledge and strength and wisdom. You're our God. There is no other. We, you welcomed us into your family, and we're forever grateful for that privilege. We need you to help us live as you would have us live so we can be examples to others to lead them to you, Lord. We give you all praise because you're the only one worthy and you give us life. We trust you, God. Show us what you want us to do. Lead us by your truth and teach us. Our hope is in you. You, Lord, are merciful, and your love endures forever. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive our sins, heal those who are sick or injured, comfort those who mourn. Direct us, Lord, and give us success in rebuilding this church of yours. Not for our sake, Lord, but for your sake, to bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, you have your communion elements? Okie dokie, here we go. As we faithfully wait on the Lord's return, we'll continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper, or we call it communion. And it's very important to remember it, because every time we take communion, the gospel is proclaimed once again, and we believe it and embrace it. It reminds us of what Jesus did for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll take the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. 
In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's take it together. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Now let's uh, recite the Lord's Prayer. Um, I have that on the uh, PowerPoint. You guys know the Lord's Prayer, right? We're good. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now I'm going to take this sheet over with me because I've got the songs on it, and I'm going to turn this mic on because the other mics don't pick up over there. One, two. Oh, there we go. And I'll, um, I'll try to hit all the notes. But you're very on singing. If I stop playing, okay. It worked well on Friday, mm -hmm. and I don't know why. Well, I'm, I'm so nervous today because I know we're seeing this live stream. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys know how <laughs> how I play. <laughs> okay, amazing grace. This was it. If we didn't have the grace of God, we wouldn't even be here. Amen. We wouldn't be here. Amen. So we sing amazing grace to give Him praise. Okay, let's go. Lord, bless these hands. Thank you. 
sweet hour of prayer. just, ooh, I don't like that around my neck. I've got to remember to uh, just set it up. Oh, the light. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. You don't think that it shines way out here. Right over there. <laughs> okay. Um, sports fans here? 
Baseball? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you know who Sandy Koufax is? Oh, you must know. You heard the name. Well, who is he? Pitcher. Okay. He's a, an American former left-handed pitcher in the Major League Baseball. And his career, his entire career, was with one team. Not sure which one? You thinking? The Dodgers. Used to be the Brooklyn Dodgers. And then now it's Los Angeles. See, he knows. And uh, his career went from 1955 to 1966. You're going to ask, what's that got to do with Yom Kippur, right? He has been hailed as one of the greatest pitchers in baseball history. And left-handed to boot. But here's something that you probably don't know about him. And this had uh, created a lot of uh, publicity for him, too. This, he's in the Hall of Fame. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1972. And he is one of the most famous Jewish athletes in American sports. So you know where this is going. He made national headlines when he refused to pitch in the first game of the 1965 World Series. Guess what day that was on? Yom Kippur, you're absolutely right. And he refused to play because that is the day they don't do anything. Well, I shouldn't say they don't do anything because they, uh, they fast, they worship God, they pray. They don't play baseball. And as you saw in the video, they don't turn the lights on, they don't turn the lights off, they don't drive the cars, but they have fun on the bicycles if they don't follow the, uh, the routine. Okay, now his replacement that day, do you know who the replacement was? I do. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you got it in front of you. Yeah, Don Drysdale. Famous name? That's right. But he ended up being pulled from the game for poor performance. <laughs> and he told the, uh, the manager, the, the Dodgers manager, who was Walt Alston, Walter Alston at that time, and he says, I bet you wish I was Jewish too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they had, to, uh, had somebody else play. Because if he was, then he wouldn't have been able to play either. Anyway, back to the, uh, the actual man. I thought that was kind of cool. It was, I thought it was funny. And it's true. They, they follow the faith religiously. And, uh, well, that's what it is. And uh, in order to do so, he had to be obedient to it and not, not play baseball on that day because that's the holiest of holiest days for the Jewish faith. Anyway, Yom Kippur is the only day in which the high priest could enter into the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, in the Temple of Jerusalem. The high priest would perform a series of rituals and sprinkle blood from sacrificed animals on the Ark of the Covenant. It's the Ark of the Covenant that is inside the Holy of Holies, and that's where the Ten Commandment plaques were held. The ceremony was to make atonement and to ask God's forgiveness on behalf of all of the people of Israel. The tradition continued until the destruction of the Second Temple by the Roman, um, Roman Empire in the 70 AD. And then the ritual passed over to the rabbis, and so they have services in the synagogue for the atonement without the sacrifices. The Lord's Feast, and they're called the Lord's Feast, and not the Jewish Feast, the Lord's Feasts are all listed in Leviticus 23, but uh, we're using Leviticus 16 for the information on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. The Feast of Trumpets started off with a blast of a trumpet and with a celebration of Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, or the new year. And then it went through the Days of Awe, or the Days of Repentance, and then, which uh, brought it 10 days later, to the um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. All Israel stops for this day. And we saw in the video that that's literal. They, the country is shut down. The highways are not used. The only ones that are used are in the um, Arab towns and cities. 
they, they don't abide by those rules. So they can use their uh, streets, but nowhere in uh, Israel do they drive the cars on those highways. It was kind of amazing seeing that on the, the video, wasn't it? A time during the days of awe is to seek reconciliation with people that you may have wronged through the year and to seek forgiveness from God. I'm going to start off with Romans 3, verse 10. Whoops, see I said I had the Lord's Prayer up there. Romans 3, verse 10. It tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. So seek forgiveness from God for sins committed through the year. That's what they had to do. Fasting is done to remove distraction. But every time you're fasting, you're giving up food, so you think about food all the time. So it's a discipline. You discipline yourself not to think of it, but you pray while you fast. The purpose is to examine your life as an individual and as a community to become better people, to be considerate of others. But before we go any further, I need to remind you that the Word of God teaches us that we are to rest in God's grace which is more than sufficient to deal with our past. And to celebrate the life in Christ that we now have and into eternity and be filled with hope for tomorrow and to walk by faith. Now that's only if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't, you may as well go through the rituals. It'll do as much good for you. 1 John 2 verses 1 to 3. I'm so pleased that that all works. We have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Now we're going to uh, kick into uh, Leviticus chapter 16. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in a cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering, and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash, and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats, as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and his house. How far down does that go? That's it there? Okay. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. For the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now the reason for the uh, casting lots for the, the, two, um, the two goats, they're supposed to be twins, identical twins. So you can't tell one from another. So you cast the lots, which is called Purim, and the one that uh, is chosen to die, that one gets slaughtered and the blood gets sprinkled. The other one, hands are laid on it, the sins are put onto that goat, and then it's led away to the wilderness to be let go. It's a process that they go through every year. Now, 
on Friday, we, we did review why Aaron's sons had died. And if you look into Leviticus 10, you'll see why they had died. They did this all improper. They wanted to get close to God, but they did it the wrong way. Now, when they do the, um, you, you heard there where God comes down in a cloud, and he, uh, he's there at the mercy seat. When they go in with the incense, they're creating a cloud with that smoke. And the, the smoke that the people make mingles with the smoke or the cloud of God, and that's how they get close. But they did it wrong. They did it wrong, and they died. <clears throat> but read Leviticus 10, and you'll uh, get the full story of it. Hebrews 7 Verses 11 to 13. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest should rise according to the order of Meshilzadeh and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Now, Aaron was a Levite. The priests are Levites. They come down from that line. Okay, Meshilzadeh was not Levite. All right, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. That says starting at verse 14? Okay. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So we know that Jesus is our high priest. That's not in the law of Moses. So therefore, it doesn't follow through with what the Torah says. All right, we're going to carry on to Hebrews 7, verse 18. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitability. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So the way the law was going, you could not be saved by what they had to do. And in the law, they had to abide by all of the rituals that were being put into place. But we don't have to do that. And the reason we don't have to do that is because we have Jesus. We accepted Jesus into our hearts. Okay, I'm just going to carry on with Scripture because that's, that tells the story a whole lot easier than me explaining it. So Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 3. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news, that God has prepared this rest, has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe... Does that go right into number three? Yeah. Okay. Only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, In my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Now you know when he did that, when they were traveling through the wilderness. Now we're going to go into the book of Acts, and we see how the chosen people will be restored, because... He's made it clear that the chosen people will be restored. And we know who the chosen people are. They're the Hebrews or the Jewish people. Okay, Acts chapter 15. I don't know why I keep moving over here because I'm still going through the metal thing. I like to see that it's changing. Yeah. <laughs> Acts 15 chapter, or verses 12 to 14. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Before I go any further, do you know what Gentiles mean? I think I told you once before. You don't remember? Hmm? It's anyone that's not Jewish. 
But Gentile is nation. It's the nations. Like we remember um, when uh, God chose Abraham. He's the first one that he had chosen. He was a Gentile. Because there were no Jewish people yet. But he was a Hebrew. So he was, he was a Hebrew, but he was a Gentile. Because it hadn't been divided up, and were, he hadn't chosen them yet. But Abraham was the first to be chosen, and then it, uh, he told him that he was going to make a great nation from him. But I'm not going to go further with that, otherwise it'll... Anyway, verse 13. When they had finished, James stood up and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this con conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it is written, Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. He said long ago, way back, before uh, Jesus came, that what was going to happen. Okay, when um, they do references back to the Old Testament, I always like to go back to the Old Testament to make sure, make sure that they're putting the right references and everything in there to make sure it's right. Okay, what they were referring to is in Amos. So Amos chapter nine. It says, Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David and will rebuild its ruins and restore it. Now, Amos was a long time before uh, Paul was there uh, preaching to the Gentiles. The law cannot take away sin. What is needed is grace, and grace comes in the name of Jesus. The Day of Atonement had to be followed in order to be able to partake in the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot. That is when the Lord resided with the house, the Hebrew nation, in the wilderness. Their sins had to be atoned for. So they had to be cleansed. So again, we go back to the New Testament to see what we're told with that. And it's Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20. It's in the right place this time. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And we know what happened when Jesus died on the cross. The curtain was torn. And it was torn from the top to the bottom. And that curtain is what separated the most holy place. There's the holy place and the most holy place, the holy of holies. As believers, we have access to the Holy of Holies, and we have access to God Almighty through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We're no longer under the Old Covenant. Romans 10, verses 5 to 7. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want an anim animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. First Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's atonement. The day of atonement is fulfilled. Christ has atoned our sins. Did that change to Hebrews 10, 1 to 3? Oh, 1 to 2? Okay. <coughs> Are you okay? Yeah. Allergies? Yeah. No, aren't they wonderful? <laughs> the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. Not the good things themselves, 
The sacrifices under that system were repeated year, repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. Verse 3 of Hebrews 10. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. It didn't come into that? No, it says Hebrews 10, 3, and it says Romans 3, 10, there's none righteous. So that one was right, and then we switched to the next word. It was everyone. Yeah, so it was just cool. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me that one got in the wrong place before, too. Okay. So this verse 3 is, but instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. So the... That's hmm? Romans 3.23. Now that says Romans 3.23. No one is... Er... Okay, so I didn't put the number 3 in there. Okay. Anyway, you heard it twice. You know what it says. <coughs> they were reminded every year that they had sinned and their sin hadn't been cleared away. We did it once. We accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And our sins have been atoned. All right, I started off with Romans 3.10. And Romans 3.10 says, Not one. The Bible tells us that because we have a sin nature, we are not righteous in God's sight. And there's nothing that we can do to rectify that on our own. Romans 3, 23, that was the next one, right? Okay. It says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We all have sin in our hearts. It's our very nature to sin. We're, we're born with sin, and without Jesus, we're under the power of sin's control. So we need to admit that we're sinners. What I'm going through, as you'll probably recognize, is the Roman road. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin results in death. We all face physical death, and that's the result of sin, but worse than that is spiritual death, to be separated from God. Unless we're reborn, it will last for all eternity. The Bible clearly teaches there is a place called the lake of fire where lost people will be destroyed. It's a place where people who are spiritually dead will remain. And because of sin, we deserve death. We didn't have to go to the cross. Jesus went to the cross for us. He took our sin upon himself. But salvation is a gift. It's not something that we can work for. It's not something that we can earn. It's a gift, but we have to receive it. We have to ask for it. We have to ask God for forgiveness for our sins to be saved. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. When Jesus died on the cross for us, he paid the sin for each one of us individually. He paid for the sin of the world. Sins committed already and sins that will be committed at some point in the future. The only requirement that we have is that we believe him. We believe the gospel. We accept the salvation. But we have to repent of our sins and recognize that we are sinners and we can have new life through him. There is no religion. There is no church that can give you salvation. And there's no family heritage or ancestral claim that can make you a Christian. The only way you can do that is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And God loves you. And the gift of life is waiting. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you know, the worst of it is we have no idea how much time we've got left. We have people that we know that are dying. They've got cancer or they've got some other uh, sickness. Or they may go out on the road and end up uh, getting in a car accident. Um, that young fellow, Tabitha's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he wasn't planning on getting in a car accident and burning up. It happens. 
and it doesn't matter how old you are. You could trip and fall. Oh my goodness, I trip and fall all the time. Not as often as run, but uh, it could happen. You could fall, you could hit your head, you could have a heart attack. And there's no age limit on that either. Um, Ron checks obits all the time, and we're finding there's more and more younger people that are dying now. So it's not, it, death isn't age related. Doesn't matter how old you are, you can die. We need to remember to call out to God in the name of Jesus. Romans 10 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now there's a term, justification, that's used in the Bible. And it's, it's a legal term. It's um, sort of legalistic. But when you call on Jesus, you are justified. You become righteous in the eyes of God. You can never stand condemned again because Christ's perfect righteousness has now been given to you. Every sin you've ever committed or ever will committed, commit is covered. And that's through the spotless Lamb of God who willingly gave his life for each of us. And that was on Passover. There's a purpose that we keep going through these feasts. The timeline that's shown on the feasts is the timeline of everything that brought Jesus to earth, to us. And everything that had happened to give us salvation. To understand a little of what uh, Christ had suffered, if you read Isaiah, Isaiah's in the Old Testament, and it was written hundreds of years before Jesus came, but it listed in detail what he had gone through. He was a suffering, sor suffering servant, man of sorrows. Those are uh, terms that's used to describe him. So Isaiah 52 and 53 is what covers it. Oh, I did write down. Um, that was written 700 years before Christ came. Now, Scripture declares God's sovereign work to the elect. That means the chosen. However, it's also clear that people are held responsible to believe the gospel. Nobody can force anyone to believe it. Each individual is responsible to accept whatever they choose. Romans 2, 19 and 20. Do I have that one on there? No, I didn't put that on there. It's... Um, I didn't even put it in here. I just put the... <laughs> Boy, I did good on that one. Those who refuse to accept Jesus as their personal Savior do so of their own accord. You either choose or you don't choose. Not making a decision is making a decision. Jesus is greatly grieved. It says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. This is Jesus talking. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive life. No, I don't have that one on there either. Oh, that's John uh, chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. Jesus also told unbelievers in John 8, 24, that is why I said that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, which is God, you will die in your sins. And that's where I'm going to finish, because it's up to each individual. I'm not concerned with, with you here, because I already know. But there's so many people that haven't accepted Jesus, and time is running short. Whether it's because of uh, wars, or famines, or pestilence, or everything else that gets listed. Um, we have no idea. Where we could die like that. And we have to have a decision. Where are we going to go? Are we going to go to heaven or are we going to go to hell? Choice is yours. We're going to sing a few more songs. You'll have to switch that back to uh, open song. And then it's right there. Thank you. 
got my finger on the wrong actual my thumb. That's what gives me the trouble. That's the, the joy of practicing so much. You know, with lily white hands, you know, they're, they're delicate. <laughs> anyway, I'm finding that it, it hurts. All right, we're ready to go in? Yep.
Verse 1. Oops. I put those uh, sharks in there, but that just messes me up. Yeah. 
Joey. Need a 